everyone, I'm James Boyle. I'm an associate solicitor at Taylor Vinters. Um, I specialize in data protection and commercial technology contracts. Um, so the task that I have before me today is to talk to you about the GDPR, um, which stands for the General Data Protection Regulation in approximately 30 to 40 minutes. Um, this is a piece of legislation that's 173 recitals long um, and 99 substantive articles. Um, so I'm going to start this talk by saying two things. Um, for those of you who aren't already familiar with the new rules, um, if I'm assuming anything or anything isn't clear, please interrupt me. Because this is kind of, I'm quite familiar with this, but if I'm not making sense, please stop me and we can explain some more of the concepts in more detail. The second thing I will say is that for those of you who might already classify yourselves as GDPR ninjas, you'll notice that I'm going to skip over quite a few of the substantive things to try and get across the really key practical things that a lot of us in the room need to be thinking about. So as we go through the talk, um, you'll see that in a few areas I've put up a little red asterisk. This essentially means that I've simplified the relevant provisions of the law that I'm going to be talking about. And then anything highlighted in red, other than those little stars, means that it's a key change compared to the current law. So what is the GDPR? Well, it's the General Data Protection Regulation, and it's European legislation, which largely replaces our current law, which is the Data Protection Act 1998. The 25th of May next year is an important date for two reasons, um, not least because it does happen to be my cat's fourth birthday, um, and it is also the date when the GDPR comes into force. Um, crucially, it will apply throughout Europe, and it will apply to businesses who are outside of the EU who are monitoring or selling to EU citizens. So at the moment, if you have an international business that has all of their sort of hardware based outside of the EU, they can often skirt the legislation. Under the GDPR, that would no longer be the case. Um, so all sort of US hosting providers that might be dealing with EU citizens will very much fall into these new rules. Um, finally, the GDPR regulates something called personal data. Um, for those of you who don't know what that means, I'll explain that in a little bit. So section one. Before we get on to the more practical things we need to be thinking about, there are a few key legal terms I need to explain. Um, what I will do as we go through is I'll give you the formal legal definition and then I'll try and give you a more practical definition that will hopefully make a bit more sense. So personal data is information which relates to an identified or identifiable person. Um, this is quite vague. Um, I think the easiest way to understand this is to think things like our name, address, identification number. Um, under the new law, under the, under the GDPR, things like location data, online identifiers and IP addresses will also be personal data. It's worth bearing in mind that this definition is really widely drawn, and it's not just about what information you might hold on your systems. It's about what information you can combine that with that might already be publicly available that enables you to identify that single living individual. So what I'd like to do now is pause briefly and ask some of you who have a mobile phone or a tablet to open your internet browser um, and start a Google search using two terms that I will provide to you. So I work at Taylor Vinters, which is the name of my employer. Um, and as part of the sort of thing we have to do when we talk about ourselves on the website, we have to list hobbies. Um, now I just moved home, and I think I'm a lot better at DIY than I actually am. Um, so what I'm going to do is if I ask those of you who have your Google search open to type in the words Taylor Vinters and then a space and then DIY, um, hit return and you should be able to find my profile as the first listed entry on Google. And the reason why I'm asking you to do this is because the legislation and the definition of personal data is widely drafted enough to actually include the phrase Taylor Vinters and DIY as being part of my personal data. Um, so I think the key point that I'm hoping you'll all take away from this is that it often isn't quite as simple as thinking personal data is only name, address and postcode. It can be all sorts of other things and it's all about what you can link up that data with and whether you can pick out a single living individual as a result of linking up that data. So there are two types of personal data. Um, the one that we've run through is just called personal data. And then at the moment, the second category is called sensitive personal data. So some of you might already be familiar with that concept. That term is changing under the GDPR, and it will be called special categories of data. And this includes things like racial or ethnic origin, health data, genetic and biometric data. For this talk, it's enough for me to say that additional requirements apply if we're doing anything with special categories of data. 
It's also quite easy to think that we won't come across that very often, um, but a passport would, for example, be a special category of data because it often reveals racial origin. Okay, so this is where we get on some more of the technical legal terminology. So under the law, there are a couple of key concepts. Um, one, of, one of those is who's a data controller and who's a data processor. So under the law, a controller is the person who decides why and how data is used. So that will usually be people like online retailers, online consumer-facing businesses, local authorities, schools, and employers. And a processor does what they're told to do with the data. So this will be someone like cloud-based service providers, so think Dropbox, Amazon Web Service, Google, and delivery companies, say so DPD, Royal Mail, as well as outsourced payroll and IT providers. Now, I promised at the start to give you a practical example as we go through. So I think the easiest way to think about this distinction is to think about what happens when we order a product online. So if anyone can volunteer a website that they recently purchased the product from, I won't ask you what you bought, so I'll just use that for the example. Amazon, Amazon great one. So say that I order something from Amazon, I give my personal data to Amazon, so they get my name, my address, as well as an order instruction from me. Amazon will then use my personal data to sort of pick a parcel out and then package it up. They'll then pass that to a delivery company. So for the sake of this example, I'm going to use DPD. When DPD receive that parcel from Amazon, DPD simply receive an instruction to deliver that data, to, to deliver the parcel to me using the data on the front of that package. Because DPD don't have any discretion over what it is they're doing with that data, that makes them the processor. So in that example, Amazon are the controller, and DPD is the processor, because they're simply doing what they're told to with that data. Is that clear for everyone, or I can give another example? Cool. So underpinning all of the stuff that we're going to talk about um, are the data protection principles. Um, these are largely the same under the GDPR as they were under the DPA. Um, they are enhanced slightly. So the first principle is that data has to be processed lawfully, fairly, and, transparent, and transparently. This is really unhelpfully vague. Um, it's also probably the most important principle, um, so I'm going to skip explaining this one now and come on to it in the next slide in more detail. When we talk about purpose limitation, this essentially means that when we are handling people's personal data, we should have told them why we were collecting it in the first place, and we shouldn't go beyond that once we hold it. So the classic example here would be, well, I order something from Amazon, and I haven't allowed them to send me marketing emails. And then six months down the line, Amazon think it would be great if they could start marketing to me. Well, if they did that, aside from breaching a couple of the other pieces of legislation which we've already sort of come up against today, that would also be a breach of the second data protection principle. When we talk about data minimization, we mean that we shouldn't be collecting more data than we need to to carry out the purposes. So one example that I came across a couple of years ago was I was acting for a toy manufacturer. And as part of the toys that they were selling into the early learning centre, they coupled that with a survey. And the survey was asking the customers for feedback about how they thought the products were, what their kids thought of them. And on the survey form, they were collecting the customer's name, date of birth, address, all sorts of details about their children. When I quizzed them on this, because we were going through the data protection principles, it turned out they didn't care who the customers were. All they wanted was the feedback about how the toys are being used. So as part of bringing them up to speed with complying with the principles, we simply stripped out all of that additional information collection because they didn't want it in the first place. If they had wanted it, then we could have probably found a way to enable them to collect in a, in a legitimate way. But the key thing here when we're talking about data minimization is looking at the projects that you've currently got going on and asking the question, could I actually collect less data than I am at the moment and still meet the aims of the project? Accuracy is fairly self-explanatory. We need to make sure the data we collect is up to date. Um, this is one of the reasons why when we phone up our banks or credit card providers, they say, oh, and by the way, is your address still 53 Alex Road, or is this still your phone number? That's a really easy and kind of <coughs> good way that banks have sort of built into their process as a way of making sure they're compliant with this principle. Storage limitation is being enhanced under the GDPR. I'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, it's enough to say here that as well as we shouldn't be collecting more information than we need to for a specific purpose. Once that purpose is finished, there's no real need for us to be holding on to it. So we should be actively reviewing the information that we hold and deleting it if we no longer have a reason to store it. <coughs> 
Integrity and confidentiality, we've already discussed quite a lot today. This essentially means that you need to keep the data secure. And there is a new principle being introduced under the GDPR around accountability. And this will have a huge impact in terms of the amount of records everyone needs to keep. I'm not going to go into this in any more detail um, in terms of the records, but if that's particularly relevant to anyone else, then I will try and leave sort of five or ten minutes at the end for questions. We can go into that in more detail. So, I promised you earlier more detail on the first principle, and here we go. So when we talk about um, data being processed lawfully, fairly, and transparency, we mean quite a few things. Um, first of all, when we talk about data being processed lawfully, we mean two really key things. First is that we haven't nicked the data, so we're not processing it in breach of a confidentiality requirement. And second, we mean that we can identify something called a legal basis for processing. Now the legislation sets these out, and there are six of them. Three are really common and come up all the time, so I've only listed out those on the slide. But the most obvious one is consent. So if somebody has consented to us processing their personal data, then we can do that. The GDPR does actually give us some detail around what those consents have to, have to do in order for them to be compliant. And consent needs to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. And when we look at the guidance coming out from the regulator around consent, it's really clear that Organisations are generally relying on consent too much. So if we take an employment relationship as a classic example, it's very common to see in employment contracts that the employee consents to their data being processed for the purposes of their employment. Well, the latest thinking is that it's really not appropriate to be using consent in those circumstances, because if I refuse to consent, I won't get a job. So at that point, it's really hard to say that my consent was freely given. So in these circumstances, the employer absolutely has other legal bases available. So they could, for example, pin it on being necessary for the performance of a contract. So in order to actually employ the relevant individual, they have to carry out certain functions as the employer. So they don't necessarily need to collect consent in those contracts. So the second one, um, in addition to consent, is where you have to process someone's data to carry out a contract with them. So to go back to the Amazon example, when I order a product from Amazon, I don't have to tick a box on Amazon's website that says, I consent to you processing my personal data. And this is because Amazon can rely on the second processing condition, which is where they have to process my data in order to carry out the contract that I've entered into with them. The third one, which comes up a lot more for commercial organisations that I'm not going to spend much time on, is recognising that actually in some circumstances we might not be able to collect consent, it might not be appropriate to do that, there might not be a contract in place between us and the individual, but nevertheless it may be in the business's legitimate interest to still process that data. Okay, so that's all the kind of boring definitions and fundamentals out of the way. So what I hope is going to be really useful in this section are the, are the lists that I've set out on the slides, um, which really go through what the GDPR means for your privacy policies and your contracts. Um, if any of you want a copy of these slides, you're very welcome to them. You might be able to use them as a kind of tick list when you're going through your own contracts and policies. So the GDPR hugely increases the amount of information that needs to be given to individuals around what's being done with their data. So generally, this is usually done through something called a privacy policy. Um, so when you go online, you can often click through to a privacy policy. There's a very vague general description about what's being done with your data. Sometimes, if you're filling out a paper form as well, at the bottom of those paper forms, you might have a very generic statement on the lines of, you're giving your, your information to Plymouth University and we'll only use it in accordance with our privacy policy. The level of detail that needs to be set out in these notices is increasing. So we now need, or we will need to provide, the identity and contact details of the controller. Um, so that would be Amazon rather than DPD in our example. Why the personal data is being processed. So in our Amazon example, this would be to deliver the parcel to you. Which legal basis they're relying on. And legal basis is quite a formal term and this essentially means we now have to identify which one of those six conditions I was discussing earlier applies to that particular relationship we have. So, in the Amazon example, they would then have to declare that they are processing our personal data because they have to, to enter into a contract with us. Similarly, if we were using consent, we would have to actually call out that the reason we're processing that data is because we have consent to do so. The information requirements continue. 
Um, which I always find quite ironic because there is a statement in the GDPR that this information needs to be given in an easily accessible and short way. Um, but the legislators themselves failed to do that because this spans about two and a half pages in the regulation. So as the information continues, um, we have to explain who the data is being shared with and crucially whether the individual or whether the individual's data will be transferred outside of the EEA. Now this is something that trips up loads and loads of clients because when we talk about transfers outside of the EEA, it's not simply whether you're using a US hosting provider or if you're sending it to your group company in India. If you have a remote IT um, development company acting for you or a support and maintenance company that's remoting into your UK organization internationally, you will also be caught by this requirement because that def they would then still be classed as having processed that data internationally. Um, if that's particularly relevant to any of you, then we can chat about that in more detail later. Um, but the rules around how you engage those international contractors are changing quite significantly. So we also have to explain how long data is being stored for. This is a really difficult one because in some circumstances, we can't say that, oh, we will retain your data for six years. Um, and this is recognised in the legislation. So if we cannot identify definitively how long data is being stored for, then we can actually give a general description of how we will work out when it's time to delete it. But crucially, we can no longer say nothing about how long we keep the data for. We also need to provide a summary of individuals' rights under the legislation. Um, these have been hugely enhanced under the GDPR. I'm not going to focus on these in too much detail today. Um, and we also have to provide meaningful information about any automated decision making, such as credit scoring. Now, what exactly this means is currently unclear. Um, this is an area that's sort of ripe for future guidance. It's going to be particularly relevant to people like credit reference agencies who might be approving or declining credit applications on an automated basis. So, I want to stop for a minute and just talk about the role that privacy policies and notices play in providing this information. So privacy policies are a really convenient way of satisfying all these information requirements that I've just discussed. It's a huge pain in the bum to try and actually make sure that we give all of this information out to the individual. But we don't have to have a privacy policy. The obligation under the legislation is to make sure that individuals are given that information. So some companies, such as Microsoft, are transitioning more towards a process where when you're actually completing a text box, a small speech bubble pops up to say, we will process this information to fulfill your order. So rather than it being set out in a huge privacy policy document, a lot of businesses are now adopting a just-in-time notification. The thinking behind this is that actually it's probably a much better way of getting the information across because individuals are much more likely to see it and read it. So I suppose a, a takeaway point from the section on the information requirements will be that privacy policies and notices will almost certainly need to be updated to comply with the new rules. And then it's not quite as simple as simply saying, we will do all of these wonderful things, we will tell you all of this information under the new laws. You may need to make some tweaks to existing business practices to make sure that what you're saying in your privacy policies or notices is true. <coughs> so the second part of this section is around what we need to do when we're contracting with other people. So under the data protection legislation, uh, if we go back to the Amazon and DPD example, the legislation says that in that scenario, there has to be a written contract in place between Amazon and DPD. And that is true of any data processing relationship. Simply saying that both parties will comply with data protection legislation is not enough. The data protection laws are really kind of odd in this way because they're one of the few cases where it's not enough to say, oh, it's fine, we'll both do what we're told under it. The legislation actually sets out a series of things that those contracts need to contain. So at the moment, under the Data Protection Act, our contracts with our suppliers and customers that involve data processing have to say two things. One is that the processor, so DPD, will only act on the instructions of the controller, so Amazon. And the second is that DPD will have technical and organisational measures. Again, unhelpfully vague. When we say technical measures, we mean things like encryption, securing data, pseudonymizing where we can. And organisational measures means things like we'll train our staff on how to keep information secure, we'll lock cabinets, we'll have a clear desk policy that are in place to protect the personal data. 
Unsurprisingly, the GDPR carries through the existing requirements and expands them significantly. So now, or under the GDPR, contracts must say what data is being processed, why and for how long. So it isn't enough now in our contracts to simply say, uh, DPD, you must do what you're told with Amazon and make sure it's secure. Those contracts now actually need to explicitly set out what information is being transferred, why and how long, in the example, DPD will be handling it for. In addition, the contract needs to make sure that the people who are processing that data, so this would be DPD's employees, the delivery drivers, are actually subject to confidentiality requirements. For those of you in the room who employ staff, this is another area where your employment contracts can come in handy because you can comply with this requirement quite easily by making sure that your employees are subject to confidentiality requirements in those contracts. The next one is full of a lot of jargon and is worth spending a little bit of time on. So you, under the new rules, you can only engage something called sub-processors with the consent of the controller. Um, what I mean by sub-processor, if we jump back to my example, would be, so say DPD are super busy and just cannot deliver the parcel to me. DPD might then sub-contract out to another delivery company, say UPS. So in that scenario, we now have three parties in the contractual chain. We've got Amazon, we've got DPD, and then we've got UPS at the bottom. And in that scenario, UPS will be classed as something called a sub-processor. And this is essentially where someone who's already a data processor is then delegating their responsibilities even further down the chain. So, and for those of you in the room, this will be highly relevant if you're acting for a processor for your clients. So if you're carrying out cybersecurity consultancy services, then you will usually be a processor. But if you're then using web hosting, say by Amazon or Microsoft, then Amazon or Microsoft will absolutely be sub-processors in that contractual chain. So that kind of relationship that you might have will be something that will be impacted by the GDPR. Um, I won't spend any more time on that, but again, if that's relevant to anyone, there's questions at the end. Um, and then another requirement is that in this example, DPD would have to assist Amazon if it all goes a bit wrong, um, as well as when they carry out audits and impact assessments. And then, crucially at the end, the processor now needs to delete or return all of the personal data at the end of the services. So as well as talking about these information requirements, there are a few additional things that I wanted to point out around contracting with others under the GDPR. So I've mentioned it a little bit already, but new rules apply to transfers of personal data outside of the EEA. Um, under the GDPR, you must have a formal mechanism in place to make sure the data is protected. Um, those of you who are already a little bit familiar with the DPA, um, these are things like model contract clauses, um, certification schemes such as Privacy Shield, um, codes of conduct, which you haven't really seen yet, and binding corporate rules. Okay, so that's all of the law. And now I'm going to talk about how your organization can help improve your data handling practices, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time helping you get your own GDPR compliance project started. Okay, so how can you improve data protection practices at the moment? Well, a really useful place to start is to look at the data protection principles. Um, if you Google them, they'll come up, they're everywhere. I can give you a list of them today. Um, it's really worth going through those principles and actually thinking, well, where, where could we collect less data? or have we actually thought about who has access to what data across the business? Um, it's also worth thinking about securing devices and databases where you can delete old data. If you are using consent quite a lot across your business, then ask when was the last time we actually reviewed how we collected and managed those consents? Um, also, train your staff. The other thing to point out is that when you're asking these questions, I'm not saying here that everything has to be encrypted or you can no longer deal with any of your customers for whom you've collected consent from. What I'm saying is the really important thing under the GDPR is that you've asked these questions, you've come to a decision and you've documented that process. A lot of this legislation is principles based, so it tells you loosely what you're expected to do but not how. Um, which on the one hand makes a lot of the rules really vague, but on the other hand means that you can flex what you need to do to best suit your business. Um, so I think when you do sort of start going through your audit process or looking at how you can become GDPR compliant, this can absolutely be driven by the needs of the business and you don't have to sort of, it's not very black and white, a lot of these rules. So in terms of some questions that it might be useful to ask um, when you're trying to improve 
again, it, can we collect less data without compromising the project? Did we actually explain to people what we would be doing with their data when we collected them? Um, have we spoken to our contractors about whether they respect the personal data that we're transferring to them? Um, and are we transferring data internationally? So in terms of how you might start your own GDPR project, I think the best place to start will be to try and understand what data you hold, why, who you share it with, and who has access to it. Once you've understood that, you should then be in quite a good position to have a look at your contracts and privacy notices, um, including what you tell your employees. Um, it's quite easy when you do these audit processes to just look at your contractors and third parties, but the obligations that apply to your business and employees are sort of equally captured by the new rules. And then as a next stage, go through and say, well, actually, do our answers to questions one and two actually satisfy the list set out in section two of these slides? Um, if any of you are taking notes and want to treat yourselves to some bedtime reading, it's articles 13, 14, and 28 of the GDPR that you might want to read. And then once you've done the audit, again, it's worth thinking, are we making any transfers of data outside of the EEA? And if so, how are we making sure that those transfers are protected or up to the new standards? And then finally, assess whether you need to appoint a DPO. Um, whether or not a data, DPO means data protection officer, I should say, um, the DPO appointment requirements will apply to all public bodies and any businesses that are processing personal data on a large scale. Again, unhelpfully vague, but if you think it's relevant to you, then by all means come and have a chat about it. So that brings me to the end of the substantive talk, which I hope was useful. Thank you.